Crystal clear. So I'm pressing live. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets HR, we're launching our Indie, a rewards-based Indiegogo campaign on March 2nd. Please support us and share with your networks. You, know, you can go to HTTPS, cabinetshr.co slash crowdfunding. Our guest today is Arjun Ray. Arjun, are you going to be great today? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for asking. How are you? I'm doing great too. Thank you. Arjun is a New York City-based entrepreneur originally from West Windsor, Windsor, New Jersey, a.k.a. Princeton Junction. Since high school, he has been networking with some of the most well-known entrepreneurs and even worked in a few projects and startups of his own. He's currently on a mission to support small business with the power of visualized data science for digital marketing at hellowiffy.com. So what's, um, and you have a lot going on. We're going to, you know, do a deep dive later on. But what's Mm -hmm. the one thing you're focused on right now? Like what's really like taking up most of your time? Taking up most of my time is building the biggest company in the world uh, while helping the smallest for the price of a cup of coffee. So you mentioned data science, you mentioned visualization. That's, that's pretty much what we're doing right now with Hello Woofy. It's uh, it's it's pretty much a, a pretty big goal um, to you know get to the to that level. But uh, we seem to be doing pretty well. We've only been around for 14 months, but we grew 21,000 percent last year. That's 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 crazy, insane growth. How do you like? But that crazy growth, I mean, of course, it's this, this good thing and bad thing, right? It's good because you're growing as bad. Like, how do you control the growth? How uh-huh. do you how do you keep your culture like you want it? And, you know, how do you have you been working with all those like sort of challenges? Yeah, it's, it's, it's important to have the right people around. So we literally went from, you know, 15 customers, 20 customers to last I checked, we were at about 83, 8,400 customers on our platform. And uh, just, you know, we didn't add a couple of hundred, we added several thousands and we'll probably double the, the customers by the end of the year and we'll probably triple uh, if not more. Um, so that's, it's all about having the right mentors around you. Um, so they can tell you, you know, take a look at this because I, I've, I've seen this happen before. Don't make that mistake. Um, set up this infrastructure, set up that, you know, a campaign. And, uh, so it, it's definitely, definitely owe a lot to the mentors and people who are the experts way better than I am for in any of the categories, you know, whether it's marketing, engineering, finance, you know, legal. Um, so I would say mentors has been the, has been one of the most important things and looking, leading by example. Um, you know, after the the feedback comes through from the advisors or investors. So, how did you grow so much? Was this was it was just a matter of luck, um, the right marketing plan, the right mentors? You said like it was a combination of everything. Yeah, it's a great question. So I always say when startups are launching, you know, it's painful to add people one at a time to the platform, right? I was doing that, you know, interviewing people, doing customer discovery groups, and then adding people to our platform to get feedback, but it's not scalable. I mean, there is a point in, there is a phase of your startup where you have to do non-scalable things, and I'm still doing non-scalable things, but that are still having impacts, a major impact. So back then we launched with a company called AppSumo, which is our channel partner. And uh, once we were able to, you know, put together about, you know, a thousand customers, we quickly figure out what our avatar look like. And once you figure out your avatar or or the persona of a customer that, you know, is willing to buy from you, is willing to use your product and things like that, then it's much easier to turn on paid advertising to then get people who are similar to those avatars, similar to those personas, but you can find the next 10,000, the next million. And so we use uh, obviously Facebook lookalike audiences, we, um, which is a uh, part of the Facebook advertising platform. We just turned on Pinterest act alike audiences, which is similar, similar approach um, and retargeting, but you don't want to turn on paid advertising before you get your first 1000 customers, because if you don't, you have no idea what your avatar will look like, a persona will look like of a customer and you're shooting in the dark. Um, but if you want to save capital, if you want to save, you know, Make, a, make sure that every dollar is counting. You want to take that approach is first find a channel partner, find who sticks around, who's converting into your customer, and then find the next 10, 15, 50,000 you know, people who are just like that person. So I would say that, would be, that was one of the important things there. The other thing is build a community. We have a great community called Content Masters. Uh, it's just a community for online entrepreneurs in our Facebook group. And the reason why we put it together is originally just to get feedback <clears throat> to find out, you know, what are the features that people need? What are the features that people like or don't like? And, uh, you know, if we were going to build a new feature, we always go in there and say, hey, what do you think about this wireframe? 
So that approach really helped us out originally. We only had like a few hundred people in there. We have about 3,000 people in there of the 8,300, 8,400 customers. And uh, it's been, it's continued to be very powerful and a very organic family, essentially. Um, and we keep going back to raise capital. You mentioned equity crowdfunding or crowdfunding in general. We've done two campaigns. We raised about just under $600,000 last year in equity crowdfunding. And we kept going back, quote unquote, to the, to the well which was the uh, the Facebook group and of course our newsletter you know newsletter as well and other social channels but we uh, we keep going back and customers keep investing into the company and owning a piece of it as a result and they can make all of it back if they become an affiliate which is the the upside um and uh, and continue having a piece of the company as well so i think a lot of entrepreneurs this is my opinion i think a lot of entrepreneurs who waste time and resources chasing people are not the target demographic right can you yeah, tell and, and not to go after you, you know, not to waste funds on people who are not your target demographic. Yeah, and 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 platforms do a good job in you know incentiv in making it seem like oh you can reach forty thousand people if you boost your posts or you can reach you know a million people if you spend five dollars a day or you can you know customize your spend. Those things are not the best way to do your Facebook ads. It's not the best way to do any kind of advertising with just shooting in the dark and with no targeting, with no audience metrics and, and things like that. So that's why I was saying is super important to make sure that you are, you have your avatar honed in the kind of person you have. I mean, for, for example, us, we have a ton of furloughed employees who came out in 2020 and they've turned into coaches. They've turned into podcasters. They've turned into, you know, small business owners who are running Etsy stores or Shopify stores. Those are the kinds of people that we're supporting. And, they can't afford more than 12 bucks a month. I mean, many of our customers are choosing between, you know, rent and food and, and things like that. They're just getting started. Some of them have been forced into small businesses, launching their own online businesses. So we want to support their, their endeavors, but at the same time, we're also trying to build a cutting edge platform that gives them, think of it like the nukes of marketing essentially, so that they can compete with the biggest companies in the world. And that just resonates really well with our, our core, uh, core demographic of, of customers. So in the past few years, you started a few companies, you're, you're in entrepreneurship, you've been in a lot of entrepreneurship items. What excites you about being an entrepreneur? Why keep on doing this over and over again? Just being able to, so I, whenever I have an idea, I refine it in my head. I, you know, experiment, you know, to compare out different ways to build it in my head. I almost like, you know, simulate it inside my mind. And then once I come up with something that's tangible, you know, tangible enough, I'll put it into Illustrator and design it. And, and then, you know, eventually get an engineering team behind it to, uh, to build it out. Um, so it's super exciting to see something go from a, a, a idea, which sometimes is very, you know, futuristic. Um, I love sci-fi and I love, you know, seeing where technology can grow. And some of the things that we've been building today are very futuristic. I mean, you know, we, we it, and it, it was a result of thinking like that and having people around you that can execute on that as well. It's not just about thinking, but actually building it. And then at the end of the day, the results matter. The results really do matter when it comes to driving revenue, driving engagement, driving, you know, value for, for the customer. So the reason, you know, the reason I like doing this, uh, you know, is because I see the, the upside and I see the potential of the idea, but more importantly, whenever I see customers say, you know, oh my God, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen and it's affordable and it's going to help me with my business and, you know, maintain, keep my business online and, and flourishing. Th that's just an automatic, amazing, you know, feedback I can, I can ever ask for. So a few, few, day, a few years ago, you took a place in a pitch competition, I think C capital pitch event. Yep. They're you one know, of our investors. Yeah. So, you know, I, I know, a lot of people, once they raise money like you did, they don't put themselves out there or they don't put themselves out there at all. Why from your point of view, it's so important you do like these pitch events, put yourself out there, pre-idea out there, even though you have revenue, you've raised funds. Yeah. Why is that important? Well, because half my job is raising capital and the other half is keeping the uh, the company afloat and then moving forward. So, I mean, I've put in about 170K in credit cards and savings. I mean, I was down to my last 10 bucks, probably 100 bucks in my bank account a couple of years ago. Two years ago, uh, when we were you know building the company out, and it was very important that we keep moving moving forward. So half my job, like as I mentioned, is raising capital and raising capital from people who can help us get to the next level. Um, and I'm very proud that we have about 2,500 you know uh, people who just came off the street, you know, essentially invested in the company, hundred dollars at a time. Some of them are our customers. One customer put in ten thousand dollars into the company during the equity crowdfunding campaign. So I'm very proud to have people that we can go, you know, we've raised from who are also our customers and 
in my opinion, and talking to a lot of, you know, very well-known investors, it de-risks the company when customers are buying the product, investing in the company, and they're giving feedback and directly having an impact on the product roadmap as well. That's basically the best kind of investor you can ever ask for, right? Not someone who just writes a check and, and, and walks away uh, and then checks in on you in five years to see where their money is at. Um, so we're very proud of having our customers invested as well. Um, and, and the other reason I, I, I love pitches and, and pitching, I mean, I pitch multiple times a day on Clubhouse and, uh, you know, for, for capital or, you know, in, in private meetings with angel investors and funds is because it helps me refine the product, the offering, the solution, the problem, the challenge, the market size. And uh, I mean, I have a pretty honed in pitch at this point and it, it does pretty well. We end up, you know, winning most majority of the competitions we end up ending, you know, going, going into or at least coming in second. Um, and so that's kind of why I do it. It's practice also. <laughs> so why do you think, you know, there's a few people, the people like you who you know, do what you're doing, pitching, putting themselves out there, but it's like a majority of entrepreneurs are not doing that. Why do you think that is? There's a reason why there's the 1% of the world in terms of wealth. And I don't mean the people who've inherited their wealth. I mean, people who've really have the calluses to show the grit to, you know, to exhibit there's a reason why there's a 1%. There's also the reason why there's a, the, the next 4% behind them, right? Then the 5% and then the 10%. And the reason why they, they, they're they there is because they worked really hard. They put themselves out. They, they created almost a, a reality around themselves, an artificial reality where they had already succeeded and they were on their way up, right? There's, there's, a, there's a certain kind of mindset you need. So, I mean, <laughs> I remember being in a... In a, uh, in a conference uh, a couple of years ago at, at uh, Advertising Week and the CEO of Havas, um, which is a very underdog holding company of agencies, advertising agency in the world. I think they, they had about 10,000 people uh, around the world at that point. And there's another gentleman who was a CEO of a much larger company that was a part of the uh, WPP group, which has about a, had about 120,000 people at that point. And he they kept going back and forth about how, which one's better, why they're better. And, and at the end of the day, you know, David Jones, who was the former CEO of us with 10,000 people, he said, well, guess what? There aren't 100,000, 120,000 people who are at the top of their game, the best creatives, the best copywriters, the best strategists in the world. They're just, this is not possible. And, uh, and, he, and he won the argument because less is more. And, uh, and the mindset was the most important thing. His agency's mindset for being frugal, being the underdog was more important than saying, we have so many people working on this, on this company that that's the reason why it's better. So I hope that answers your question. There's a reason why there's a 1% and there's a reason why some people win and others just stay on the sidelines and wonder why it happened. <laughs> so next let's talk about Clubhouse. Sure. So first about Clubhouse, is the hype real about Clubhouse? Is hype is Clubhouse really all that like people are making it out to be? Or is this it depends what you end up, media platform? Yeah, it depends how you're you're getting what you're getting out of it. For us, we're doing three events a week now. I used to chime in on events and join other panels. I do that too, and I, I always get, you know, thrown into the moderator panel and 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 uh, end up, you know, providing a lot of value to other aspiring entrepreneurs and business owners who are on there. But now that I'm doing it myself, I'm also doing my own events. I'm scheduling those using Calendly so that it's you know not something that goes on for days on end. It's actually something that's easily to manage and I can have other people co-moderate co with me. Um, I'll say it's actually driving revenue. We've soft circled you know, a, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, capital, we've you know we've been able to soft circle that much, and we've turned it into our third or fourth highest uh, source of revenue um, as well, and on the organic side. So things are obviously working out at the end of the day. But the most important thing is making sure that your any of the traction channels you end up taking on. Right? There's a great book on this called Traction um, by the founder of uh, DuckDuckGo. He talks about traction channels, and he obviously didn't talk about Clubhouse years ago when he wrote the book, but this is one of our experimental uh, traction channels. The other ones are paid advertising. The other ones are podcasts, which of course we're on a podcast right now. And, uh, and, and I have about three or four that I'm simultaneously, you know, juggling to see which ones are driving the most revenue and clubhouse is second or third high, you know, third of those of that list. So you sort of already answered this question, but how does, how does someone keep from social media becoming just a time suck, so to speak? 
you use a scheduler like ours, which is hellowiffy.com for one thing. Um, so you can plan out your content schedule here. You can I let the artificial intelligence create content for you and suggest emo the perfect emojis hashtag. So you, you've really crafted the perfect marketing messages and then you just set up a campaign and you just let it do it on its own and check in on it from time to time. So that's one thing is, you know, set up yourself for success from a tech perspective. From another perspective, you also need a great CRM. You need a great inbound. You know, when you get leads, when you get people asking for demos, you want to make sure your website is set up for, you know, scheduling those demos automatically. The sales funnels are in place so that, you know, a customer is coming in, they can go through the journey of being, you know, being able to buy and then obviously be upsold and cross-sold or, or uh, you know, typical uh, uh, funnel metrics uh, right there. And then the other thing you want to make sure is also you have your Facebook pixels and your Pinterest pixels installed so that you can retarget leads that are coming in and they may not buy the first or second time, but they most likely will buy on the third or fourth time. So setting up yourself for success on social media and letting all of these tools I just mentioned, like Calendly is great. We do group, we do group sales now. We used to do one-on-one -on -one sales calls, which is not scalable. But now the funnel is automated to the point that people can just schedule, you know, uh, sales calls with me and we do about 10 people on a call, maybe six people on a call. And that's a lot more scalable, you know, getting leads from social media than just doing a one-on-one. -on -one. So I would say set up your, set up yourself for success so that that's, that's helpful. So when you do the, the calls like with 10 customers at a time, mm -hmm. do any of them ever complain that it seems impersonal to them? Or how do you work through that? No, it's actually fun. People laugh and they like you know, meet each other. And it's like a, I mean, we have a very much a family mindset. I just tend to end up having great conversations with prospects and existing customers as well, especially in our Facebook group, Content Masters. Um, so I guess I've been, I've been very lucky uh, and very, you know, blessed to have some incredible human beings who are not only investors in the company, but also customers in the company, advisors in the company. They're, it's just a great, it's just, I guess the way you treat people is, is those are the kinds of people that come to you. So one thing I really like about what you're doing, you put out a lot of video content, like you know, updates your yep. company, other items. So this is like a several part question. Like, first of all, why do this? And some mm. entrepreneurs give updates, they give like, you know, a monthly email or like something, a Twitter update. Why is it important to actually get in front of a camera and do a video? Update? Yeah, well, we're just doing things so quickly. We're building a new startup essentially every two, three, four weeks, right? So we have a lot to say and a lot to show and a lot to get feedback on. So I can't speak for the other entrepreneurs that are probably moving at a snail's pace, but we're moving at a rocket ship pace. We grew 21,000% last year. We did over 25 million API calls, which is People, for people who don't know what an API call is, like think of it every time you type a post, it's one API call looking for a recommendation for the best word, the best emoji, the best hashtag and things like that. So that's, those are all API calls. We did over 25 million to date. So we're, we're quickly becoming the, the solution for small businesses for the price of a cup of coffee. So that is something to be proud of, not only internally, but also we're super proud of our customers taking the initiative to actually build their online personas, their online marketing funnels. They're taking digital marketing into their, you know, uh, in, as, a, as a top priority, because that's what clearly the pandemic has proven is that you need to be honed in on your digital marketing efforts. And that's not just social media marketing. I know we've been talking about social media, but the, the one of the things that we want to focus on is being an end end to end solution for this underdog small business owner, right? So we start with social media scheduling using AI capabilities. We then expand it to blogging. So you can like literally, uh, you know, type an entire blog post. It will complete the sentences for you, and then you can schedule it, and then have a scheduled social post to promote the blog post. But the other thing that we realized very quickly is that uh, smart speakers were growing like crazy. Like you know, these devices here, the Echo Dot, or the you know the Echo Show, which has the touchscreen built in, or the you know the Fire TV that obviously connects to your TV. These devices were flying off the shelf during the pandemic, but guess who was winning? The Netflixes, the Hulus of the world, the biggest companies of the world were distributing more content into your living room. But the coffee shop owner, they couldn't reach you in your living room while you were sitting there and never came back to their, their coffee shop ever again, right? What if they could send you a, a cup of beans and be like, this is how you brew the perfect kind of coffee. And they could do it in video format or audio format. So we've, we've been working with Amazon for, and their help, you know, getting their help for the last six months or so. And we literally built a scheduler, just like a social media scheduler, that allows you under your name, under your white label skill, it's just like the app essentially for the Amazon store, to distribute video, audio, and text to audio content for five bucks a month or, or you know, for the price of a cup of coffee. So now you have direct access to your quarantine customers. Your small business is able to compete with all the Fortune 50 companies that have their content on the device as well. 
So that's kind of the mindset we're taking is like, how can we help the small business owner who's not very sophisticated in marketing? How can we make it so simple and data-driven that they're able to win against their comp- uh, unlimited marketing budget competition? So are you competing with companies like Buffer and Hootsuite or, or, or am I missing the mark on what you're doing? Well, Hootsuite actually, I mean, that's one of the reasons why their owl is right here. I happen to know Ryan, who's the founder. We we are a co-creating partner with them. We integrated with them. So they're they're more of a partner for us. But as far as the other companies are concerned, I mean, they're the Chevys and the Fords of the world. We're trying to be the Tesla. Not only, you know, smart, <laughs> but intelligent, but beautiful in design and uh, easy to use at any at any level. So earlier you talked about building your team at, at your company mm-hmm. and, and like, just like, you know, being a startup founder is not for everyone. I'm firm believer that being a startup employee is not for everyone. How uh-huh. do you go about knowing when to let someone go when, when that, not, you know, when they, when they don't have the right mentality or what do you want to call it to be at your startup? How do you go about doing that? How do you recognize that first of all? Yeah. When you really want someone, I'm going to answer the question another way. Cause I'm just an ultimate optimist and a positive person. You want to find people who are, who have, who have the calluses to show from previous work experience. And what I mean is that they've been through the experience before uh, and have the grit mentality to showcase that they'll, they'll do whatever it takes to get the job done. Because um, if you don't if you don't have that kind of a mentality, then it's a little bit, you know, a startup is a 24 seven operation. And I've structured the company in a way that at any given point in the day, someone is working on the company because we have a global team. So having said that, you need a certain kind of mindset for someone who can put in anything and everything it takes to, to really scale the business, whether it's on the engineering side, on the marketing side, on the sales side, um, customer service side. So it's super important to have that mindset. And if you start seeing that that mindset doesn't exist or is, is kind of going off to the wayside, you really have to pull the person aside and say, hey, this might not be for you. It, you may actually want just a stable nine to five job with benefits and the whole nine yards. And um, you know the, the, uh, the, the situation, the circumstances may not be designed for you. And that's fine. You just have to be honest with each other that you know, as an employee, as an employer, that this may not be working and, and make sure you, there's a transition period for the next person who is able to take over and they can do a knowledge transfer. That would be the most biggest, the biggest thing I'll say is knowledge transfer is super important. Have your code documented, have all the processes documented. Um, and then that's super easy when everyone's on the same page, when it, when it comes to using tools like Slack or Asana or Jira, make sure everyone's on the same page and it's documented. Yeah, I'm a firm believer what you just said, because the sooner you recognize that, the sooner that person can move on to an, the, the, an opportunity that probably might be better for them, right? Yeah, I mean, you can't force a vegan to turn into a carnivore, right? <laughs> it's like, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I, I'm a vegetarian, but, you know, from time to time, I'll do chicken kebabs, but I am pretty much a vegetarian. Like, you know, if 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 I go into a steakhouse, the only thing I'm eating is a, is a bag of fries, is a, is, a, is a basket of fries. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, if it's not going to work out, it's not going to work out. But um, yeah. So right now, what social media platform excites you the most? Is Clubhouse, TikTok, Instagram, or something different? It's definitely Clubhouse, uh, mainly because it's a 24-7 conference, and you, it's like a Zoom call. You can jump into any of the Zoom calls, and you can just have the most <clears throat> amazing conversations. And they're not just with anyone. They're with people you would have a harder time reaching out to because they're celebrities. They're entrepreneurs. They're busy. You're not, I mean, this morning I was on a, on a, on a clubhouse session co-moderating with Dave Kirpin, who's the co-founder um, of Likeable Media, one of the, you know, one of the most amazing social media agencies in the world. And I was co-moderating with him. Um, I'm going to reach out to him again. I met him years ago when he was running the company and he, you know, we were talking about how I met him during college. And then some, one of his other co-moderators reached out to me a couple of weeks ago to learn more about my company to see if she wanted to invest in the company. And then it was another co-moderator on the panel uh, as well. Um, he was like, email me. I want to learn more about your business. He's an investor and a pretty big investor as well. So that happening on a Saturday morning, I am a workaholic. I, you know, could use more balance between work life, but uh, that's the kind of, that was my morning this morning on Clubhouse in terms of like closing deals, you know, and getting prospective investors. We just closed about 50K in, in our campaign in the last couple of weeks. Um, so we're now at just below 110 raised there as well. And a lot of it came from Clubhouse. In fact, majority of it came from Clubhouse. So you brought up a good point. Like, how do you keep a track of everything, right? Do you have a schedule? Do you do Google Calendar? Just wing it? 
Like uh, you, winging is not, yeah, I use my iCalendar, which I have all of my calendars going into my iCalendar. So they're all color coded. Um, blue are for events, purple is for personal events, green are my to-dos, red are my to-dos that are high of high importance. Um, orange, when I used to be, you know, moving around the city, I would actually have an orange block that means, you know, from this time to this time I'm traveling and I'm, or I'm at a specific location. And then orange again, as I'm traveling and I'm going from one location to other. So I would have buffers between events. Um, so I just, I'm super color coded everything, everything. I mean, even our platform is super color coded. Everything means a different color, means a different functionality. And we also have colorblind support built into it with different patterns and shapes so people can use it as a creative when they're, you know, they have those kinds of disabilities. So people might not know, can you explain what is AI and what does AI actually do? In our platform? Yes. Or in general? Both, in our, both. Yeah. So this is interesting. So I'll, there, there are two forms of, there, there's machine learning and data science that, um, uh, uh, or sorry, uh, in data science, there's machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, the, the easiest example I can give you is if you take a warehouse, right, and you think about a massive warehouse from, let's say, Amazon. The machine learning side of things is the data that's there. It's the inventory, it's the things that are sitting on the shelves. It's the, it's the, it's the, the literally the data itself. And how how you make sense of it? How many jackets you have? How many books you have? You know, this the data you are you categorize it. You make sense of it. Now the AI, on the other hand, is once you know what the data is, then it's all about the processes, the strategies to get the jackets in a certain row, get the books in a certain row, get them you know you know uh, situated ar around the warehouse in a certain way, so that you can be most efficient when the orders come in, and to, you can make the, the get the orders out the door as fast as possible. So. The AI is almost like a strategy. It's a thought process. It's literally artificial intelligence. The intelligence to make those objects, uh, you know, situated in a certain way that ma maximizes efficiency and allows you to, you know, send it out as as packages. Right. That's that's the goal of a warehouse is to get the orders and deliver uh, or send them out as as fast as possible. And then machine learning, obviously, on the other side is teach, you know, learning about what is actually the data, what kind of data you have, how can you structure the data, what is the category of the data, um, which, uh, which is interesting. So we took that approach in our, our, uh, in our platform as well, which is as soon as you start typing a post, it automatically starts completing the sentences for you. It uh, suggests the perfect hashtags for you, suggests the perfect emojis for you, which have been shown to drive 50 to 70% uplift in engagement. And uh, it also finds the perfect images that are royalty free. So you don't, you're not using images from Google images that may or may not be allowed because you may or may not have uh, rights to those, using those images. So, I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's taking care of everything. All you have to do is just story tell and it'll do it with you, not, not you know, by replacing you, it just does it with you. So for your company, Hello Wolfie, can you go and look more, more detail, like how the idea came about, what you, what, what you focus on now, what's your, like your vision for it and moving forward? Yeah, it's a great question. So the, the, the name comes from my love for dogs. Like the, having the underdog mentality as an entrepreneur is super important, but also I grew up with Maltese and uh, just like your best friend, he's always there teaching you when, how, and what to post. Um, so that's, that's uh, kind of where I, I came up with the name. And this was a couple of years ago. But um, what was the second question? Where what's the um, what's the vision for the company? The vision of the company. So, like I said in the beginning of the of the of the call or the interview, we really do want to build the biggest company in the world, helping the smallest. And you know, we could be the size of Salesforce at one day down the road, but our whole price point will be focused on small businesses and helping the smallest of small businesses, not even the people who can afford fifty dollars, a hundred dollars a month in in using software, right? Like our our competitors. It's about people who can go beyond $12, $15 a month. And uh, I mean, like I said, our competitors only focus on social. We focus on social with AI, blogging with AI. We also have a Google Chrome extension that allows you to you know, auto-complete anywhere on the internet. We're using the extension and uh, you know, optimize it for emojis and schedule content right on the website itself. So, And then, of course, a smart speaker scheduler. So. We don't want to just build a company for the sake of it that's 10% better than our competitors. We are completely blowing them away. We're just just a whole new category. Um, you know, we're literally the Tesla of marketing when it comes to you know beautiful design, intelligent interface, and the Model Three. You know, being the affordability. When you say smaller company, can you define that by numbers like 
20 or below people, 50 or below, 500 or below? What's the, is there a number? I mean, we're talking about, that? yeah, we're talking about freelancers, individuals. We're talking about agencies that are three to five people. We're talking about coffee shops that have like three people and, and the owner and then the owner is the marketer and also the finance, you know, the finance person or the intern, right? Who she or he or she may not have as much experience, but this can augment her or his ability to do marketing craft messages. Um, so it's, it's, we're talking about like 70% of our country or of the world, the small businesses in the world who need, who need help for the price of a cup of coffee with all of their digital marketing. So you answered this before too, but what drives you, what drives you to do this every day, day after day after day? Revenue helps for one thing, you know, we're already up like 15, 20% month over month. So that's always exciting. Um, the vision to see, you know, whenever we build, we concept a product and a couple of months later, we can see it in action. Like for example, our, our uh, smart speaker scheduler, I've been playing around with our, you know, Alexa devices and playing around with this, the content that I've scheduled directly to my living room so that other small businesses can do the same. It's super fun. Like, it's like, it's seeing, it's like, I'm sure the Wright brothers felt like this when they built, you know, the first prototype and it flew. It's just a, it's an amazing feeling. I mean, my commute from my bedroom to my office is two seconds and I, I turn the lights on here. I turn the lights on above as well. And it feels like I just open up my own small business. Like I just open the doors and it's open for business every morning. Right. Um, and it's just that kind of approach is like, I, I know there are tens of millions of people around the world who need that kind of help when they open up their stores, they open up their doors and they need to be able to bring people into their, their stores, whether virtually or in person. And that's where we're building a software that does that. How tech savvy does someone have to be to use your product? Not at all. You don't need any degree. You don't need any certificate. It's literally like our model three, you just sit uh, and love, you know, you just sit in there, uh, you can, the steering wheel is there, the data science is available, but it's super visual, very visual. So two part question. Um, what do you like about being an entrepreneur and what is something you don't like about being an entrepreneur? Oh, I'm an optimist. So I don't know how to answer the second one, but what I like about it is that you can r literally put a dent in the universe. If you, if you work hard enough, if you stress, you know, uh, if you have a mission that you're on and you're not just doing it for the sake of it, um, you can like see job said, you know, put a dent in the universe. Um, what I don't like about it is probably you can <clears throat> be your own blocker. Sometimes, you know, you can scope creep sometimes add too many features and, and to your own detriment. So you do need a a group of people around you to make sure that they're able to give you their feedback, their suggestions, you know, keep you grounded. Um, it's very easy to dream and, and not have a vision, which once someone once said is a vision is a dream with a plan. If you don't have a plan, you're just dreaming. Uh, so it's very easy to dream to no end. So I would say that I will answer, I will answer that question that way. Happy to do a demo as well and show you how that works. Okay. Um, you should be able to share the screen. Yeah. All right. So let's do this. So for, for viewers who are now looking at uh, our screen, I mean, the idea is that it's, like I said, it's very color driven, right? The idea is that as soon as you start typing, it automatically suggests content for you. So let's just say, you know, <clears throat> how are you? How are you, Jason? Right. It'll automatically complete the sentence, give me suggestions. And I, I could be like, I love, which of course we love you, but I really like my coffee. It'll automatically complete the sentence, but then notice below it's trying to give me emoji recommendations based on what I'm typing. Now, the reason why I was mentioning that earlier is because if you take a look at research from Adobe, emojis tend to do really well in driving engagement and purchase intent. So what did we do? We mapped the entire English language to figure out exactly which emojis, which hashtags, which other emojis and hashtags tend to be used with one another so that you're not, you know, quote unquote, winging it uh, you know, when it comes out to figuring out what's, what's actually working. And then on top of that, we're also figuring out which emojis are being used in real time around the world. So you can see these are mo the more popular ones. If you like any of them, you can pick the images as the emojis. And if you click on the purple dot, <clears throat> this will actually find images for you that are royalty free based on what you typed in so far and then based on what the image is about. It even takes care of the whole uh, grunt work around finding the right uh, hashtags. So of course, you can optimize the hashtags here double click on the hashtags, maybe throw in another hashtag that might be relevant. If you take an article like the emoji one, and you paste it in, it'll automatically give you quote recommendations, hashtag recommendations. It does the whole nine years for you. So you don't have to kind of, you know, figure these things out. It's an agency in the pocket. So we started with social, like I mentioned, with scheduling social media. We then built a journal product as well that allows you to schedule content to all your favorite blogging platforms like Medium, WordPress, and soon Shopify. And then once you're done, schedule a social post to promote the blog post. 
And so like I was saying, you know, we were we also built a social media uh, social media scheduler like a uh, smart speaker scheduler that allows you to schedule content directly into people's living rooms. So we, you know, it's an example of me, uh, one of our friends at, at Amazon, Kevin, he scheduled a, a quick two minute video with Oprah Winfrey. All I had to do was go over to my TV, say, play the Kevin skill, or in your case, play the Jason skill. And the video pops up. And once, once uh, Jason's done, once Kevin's done, he could be like, hey, if you like what you hear, click on the link to the right under the description on your TV or your Alexa show device, and you can be taken to your website and to join as a masterclass. So like I said, we grew pretty fast and we, you know, we've been building quite a bit of product around the solutions and, uh, and we're just very proud of the team that, and, the, and the customers that have joined. So when you're doing the content, does your platform automatically, because they say though, you got to do different types of content on Twitter. It's going it to be the same wording. How does that work? Or do you have to do it one by one? Does that question make well, any sense? The, the, it's, it depends on the kind of content you're producing. First of all, we're talking about people who may have never done any digital marketing at all. Yeah, and they're okay. just looking to get started. They're you know considered to be unsophisticated. They don't have a degree. They don't have a certificate in this field. So, but they, they know that they need to compete with the biggest companies in their category. So just to get started, I would say the solution obviously helps them. And as they get better and better, they can then go up and, and streamline, depending on their needs, what they need. And they can throw that into the categories, into the library, and let the platform do it for them. Okay. Um, can you give us your social media links so people can reach out to you for either yourself or your company? Uh, yeah, if you just go to hellowolfie.com and go to the bottom of the website, you'll see all of our social channels there. Um, and you'll also see my email there. But I would say the only thing, uh, you know, I, I would love to, you know, get as a, as a, as a return, I guess, say, or as a, as a call to action is just give me feedback. You know, what the platform can, you know, do for you. How can we build features for, you, for the small business owner? Um, you know, what are you looking for in terms of your digital marketing funnels? And, you know, that all that feedback in our Facebook group, Content Masters, will allow us to add it directly to our roadmap. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, for Alyssa, we have the links to all, all our social media and everything he's doing. And you can find the sun at www.kevinshrblog.com. And be sure to check out our crowdfunding site at https cabinetshr.co slash crowdfunding. So um, we'll come to the end of our talk. Can you give us advice on anything you want to talk about? I would say just get started. Um, you know, what, I love some, that. Yeah. Some of the things that people think about, about doing and, and not doing this, like if you do it and you figure out that you shouldn't do it, then you'll figure out you shouldn't do it. If you want to do it, you do it and it's become very successful, then double down on it and then spend 10% of your time in things they have you have no idea about you know, marketing channels you have no idea about. So that 90% of the things you do and the resources and the time you spend is in categories that obviously bring in revenue, bring in customers, but constant, constantly be experimenting with 10 to 15% of your revenue, of your uh, time and resources in, in things you have no idea about. And that's the same thing with personal life as well. If you're in tech, then go to, go to interior design conferences and events 10% of the time. You'll be amazed who you meet. You'll be amazed where your ideas, when they're cross-pollinating, how uh, they actually make you a better person. So thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. You're doing a lot of great things and thank you for Absolutely. everything you're doing. Absolutely, Jason. Thank you so much. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.